Hey guys, Tyler here with Independence Overland. So I wanted to go over my FJ because I feel like this is long overdue. I need to do a walk around of this thing and kind of show you what I've done with it, why I've done that, and uh, just kind of go over the features and the upgrades that I've done over time. I've had this thing for 12 years, so I've had plenty of time to kind of figure out what I think works for me, what doesn't work for me. Of course, I have a biased opinion, but I think it's one of the coolest FJs that I've personally seen. There's bigger ones out there. There's ones that can crawl rocks better, but I think all in all, mine is pretty well-rounded for what most people would be looking for in one of these things. The FJ Cruisers have a V6, it's the 1G RFE, and in 2010, they actually changed it. They kind of updated that engine a little bit, but that same engine in those year ranges was used in the 4Runner and is actually still used in the 4Runner today, and it was used in some of the second gen Tacomas. So it's been an engine that's been around forever. A lot of people think that the FJ Cruisers have a V8. It does not have a V8. I wish it had a V8. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna go around what this thing is, how I built it, and I feel like it's a pretty cool setup. Part of the reason I have an FJ Cruiser is my dad had an FJ40 when I was growing up and we used to go on all sorts of cool adventures with that thing. He'd take us down the beach to go fish for sharks and then he would take us bullfrog hunting, stuff like that. Really cool thing, cool, cool memories as a child. So when I saw these come out in 2007, I kind of connected with the look and the feel of the vehicle. I thought it was cool, a cool modern take on what I had enjoyed as a kid. On the front of this, I put the Expedition 1 Kodiak bumper and I wanted a full wraparound bar just because we have so many elk and deer in Colorado. The Factor 55 stuff, I actually won a gift card at the FJ Summit at RSG Off-Road in Denver. So that's where that came from. Now at the Factor 55, I do kind of wish I had the one that was more of a teardrop shape, but this is, this is great. It's way better than a, a hook ever was. But I do kind of wish that I had the, the teardrop so I can put a shackle through it a bit easier. On the front grille, I, I bedlined that with Raptor Liner just because I like the look of the Trail Teams Editions FJs that have the black around it. But I didn't want to necessarily just spray paint mine and it was, cheaper than, uh, it was cheaper to bedline it than it was to buy those parts from the factory or from Toyota. So I just went ahead and bedlined it and then uh, my red starting to fade here, but it had kind of a cool retro look. These are the Baja Design Squadron Sports uh, and I didn't want to get the pros necessarily. I just felt like it was a little too much because I do plan on mounting two LP6s or LP9s on the front of this thing. I think it'll look really good and I'll be able to spot deer and elk ahead of time just for those nighttime runs because most of the time I'm heading out on a trip Friday night after work just like everybody else is and so you want to be able to see that kind of stuff. The Ricochet aluminum skid plates from front to rear. I went with aluminum even though they're not as strong. Um, I did go with aluminum just because it's going to cut down on weight. I updated the XD9000 to a synthetic rope and I forget the brand that I got. It was quite expensive. If you can get a winch that comes with synthetic line, you will save a ton of money. If you buy a worn winch, buy, the, buy it with the synthetic line because it is expensive. You can update later, but it's more expensive. I did it to save weight. It's less dangerous, everything like that, but it was expensive. So go ahead and do that when you order your winch if you can. Obviously, I bought an old winch. I bought it used and it's been great. I put on the front grill, I actually put my winch connection on this and... Uh, that way I can plug into it without popping the hood and everything. And then I also updated this with an aftermarket transmission cooler once I got the trailer. I probably should have done that sooner, but it didn't seem necessary. So that's the front of this thing. As far as suspension goes, what I've got is I've got a King's suspension with the remote reservoirs with adjustable compression. Being able to crank the Kings down on that compression adjustment, I turn it all the way down when I go off-road and it does make a huge difference. I've got total chaos fabrication, upper control arms, these upper control arms have a little bit more articulation, but I don't know that it's worth it. I would prefer to have a sealed system that has a little bit less flex and is just sealed off because these uniballs are really exposed. This is great for like a desert runner. This is great for like a crawler, maybe something like that where you're not putting all the miles on. But if you have a daily driver, I kind of recommend getting something more sealed. I do have disconnectable sway bar end links. Those are really nice. They do require a little bit of maintenance. It's not as nice as like what a Jeep Rubicon has or something like that. The noticeable sway when you take your sway bar off when you have a big 10 on the top, it's pretty noticeable. So for the lower control arms, I have the Ricochet off-road skid plates on the factory lower control arms. And I recently upgraded my lower control arm bushings to the Poly, and that was from Super Pro. I don't feel for an overland build, you need to go with some aftermarket lower control arm. You're actually gonna be doing more maintenance on that vehicle if you do that. So I think going with the factory stuff and for this particular setup, I wanted to do poly bushings just because they will last forever. So another thing I have on the front and the rear are the Duro bumps. And Duro bumps, bump stops are awesome. They're a dual rate uh, bump stop. And with my springs and the way I have my suspension set up, I rarely need my bump stops. But when I do, 
the duro bumps soak that up beautifully. I never have like a teeth biting moment anymore whenever I'm off on the trails and you don't see something coming up really quick and you don't have time to quite slow down. Those bump stops are amazing for that. I highly recommend those. They're not that expensive. They're not as expensive as like the Timberins or anything like that. So the duro bumps, really look at those. Those are awesome. On the tires, I am currently running a 295 75 R16 tire and those are a Nitto Ridge Grappler and these have been an awesome tire so far. I did away with the mud terrain tires last year because I've been doing so many more trips where I'm driving a long distance to somewhere and then doing trails and stuff like that from there. Or sometimes I'm just staying at national parks. So I went to an all-terrain tire and I feel like it fits what I'm doing better. I think as far as an overland build goes, um, an all-terrain tire is gonna fit the bill significantly better. And this is a burly tire that has a good thick sidewall and I really do like these tires. This is an FN Countersteer Type X, I believe. It's a 16 inch wheel. I did want more, obviously for, for off-roading, you want more tire, less wheel. So I went as small as I could with a 16 on that. And um, I think a 17 looks better, but you know, it's a uh, function over form. Nothing special on the brakes, but that is the front end of this thing. So on the back here, I have the Expedition One rear bumper with the swing out, uh, the smooth tire carry, the smooth tire, the smooth motion tire carry, I believe is what it's called. You don't have to open the swing out every time you want to open the door, which is really nice. Uh, it carries the weight of these two roto packs on this hinge. You have the option of mounting all sorts of stuff. You can get a high lift jack mount for this, which I had on for a while and I took it off because I never use a high lift jack. You have the option of getting a five gallon jerry can or two four gallon roto packs. So I went with the roto packs, even though they're more expensive, I have more fuel whenever I need it. And I have needed it through some of the longer trips in Utah, especially when you load an FJ up like this, you're gonna run out of fuel a little more often, it's heavy. So uh, this is the Blue Ridge Overland XL bag. Now this thing's awesome. It's got a lifetime warranty, it holds a ton of stuff. It's sagging pretty good because I've got a bunch of wood in it, but uh, I usually carry wood into camp. And then when we're leaving, it's a trash bag. I carry a garden hose in here usually whenever I'm using the tent setup because I can hook that to my water pump under the hood. And we'll get to that later. Over here is the refined cyclery propane mount. And I have the little, I forget what this is. It's like a five, five pound propane tank. Um, I got tired of carrying the small bottles. They run out all the time. And so this is so much easier just to go and take and get it refilled and you're good to go. So that's what I did for the rear. Now on the bumper, on the driver's side, I have one S2 Pro from Baja Designs. I felt like one light was plenty enough to back up because how often are you actually using that? And I don't have that plugged into my primary backup lighting just because I don't want to blind people at the grocery store. So it's just a push button whenever I need it and I'm on a trail, I can just light up the trail, back up, turn it off. And then on this side, I built a plastic panel and I put two 12 volt ports in it. So I can plug in like a, any sort of 12 volt accessory. Also on the rear, I have a TRD exhaust. It's the cat back exhaust. It sounds pretty awesome. It does drone a little bit after long trips. So I put a backup camera in my hitch and that's attached to my Pioneer head unit I put in here. The later FJs came with a backup camera, but mine didn't. And those, those FJs that came with them, it's on the spare tire. So if you have a bag like this, it's not functional anymore. So I put it in the hitch because that's probably one of the most protected spots on a trail that can take plenty of abuse and I put it in there using a magnet. It's like a $40 camera, it comes with a metal base plate. So I just mount the camera with that. It doesn't interfere with the signal at all or with the, the color or anything like that. So the reason I did that is whenever I'm towing, I can take that out, put the magnet on the bottom of the hitch, and then I can back up to my trailer and I can usually hook my conqueror up really quick. So it makes it to where I can move that camera around real easy and it works for me. So I have a I have a three gallon air tank that feeds into the air system. That way I have like a reserve and I can fill up a couple tires really fast. And then of course my lockers run off of the air compressor as well. Now the 2007 to 2009 FJs actually had a really weak rear differential. And the reason for that is they designed these things kind of in a rush and it was using the same differential that earlier Toyotas had that didn't weigh nearly as much as this and didn't have as much horsepower as this. And so it was kind of a problem Toyota had for a while and they put a weak differential in. I never blew mine up, which I'm, I'm pretty light footed. So I wanted to upgrade my axle. I knew I was going to have to either update it to the 2010 models or spend a little bit more and update it to something more burly. And so I went with the diamond axle. The diamond axle utilizes Toyota parts. So it's a new axle, but the actual differential is out of the Land Cruiser 80 series, which are arguably the most durable Land Cruisers ever built. 
So this thing has a massive differential, so I should not be able to destroy this, especially running the tire size that I have. This is pretty much as good as I will ever need. And it's more of a, this is more of a preventative maintenance thing. I didn't wanna blow up my old diff, so I upgraded before I did that. This did have the factory electronic locker, but now it has an air locker, an ARB air locker. When I did the rear axle with the new diff, I regeared it to four, 4.56 gears. And so I did the same on the front. So I just replaced the diff with one from East Coast Gear Supply. So I did put a locker in the front when I did that. So now I have a front and rear locker. So this thing is pretty, pretty capable as far as what it is. As far as a camper, a small camper goes, this is a very capable vehicle. This is a four link suspension in the rear. So I have metal tech on both the bottoms, the lowers and the uppers. And then I have an Icon pan hard bar. My rear suspension is the Icon Overlander Springs. Now I was using a Dobinson spring that was rated for more weight, but the problem with those is they, they sell a spring that can deal with the weight a little bit better. And I like the ride quite a bit better, but because I'm switching in between the tent setup and the camper, I had to switch back to the Icon Overlanders. And the reason for that is you don't want too stiff of a, a spring whenever you're unloaded. So if I drop the camper and I go run around, I didn't want too stiff of a spring. So um, I am sitting on the Icon Overlanders, which are designed to take a certain amount of weight and then they're, they're a dual rate spring. So it'll kind of put up with my multiple different styles of loads better. I have the FJ Toyman rear shock guards. Now I had to modify those for the sake of this axle. So I did some welding on them. They're usually prettier than what mine look like. Mine are black now, but I had to modify them to where they could bolt onto this axle because they didn't quite work the same, but I did want to protect my King suspension since I spent so much on it. So I do have those in the rear as far as guards go. And again, I have the skid plates that go all across this thing. The rear of this thing is a pretty cool little kitchen setup for for my use anyway. One of the more recent things I've done to this is I put this MPAC table on here from Springtail Solutions. It's pretty quick and easy. You just screw this in and it'll fold up. It's got the PALS webbing on it. And uh, this table is super useful. That way I can pull this down and then I put my hardcore lighting up here so I can turn that on or if the bugs are out, I can turn it to orange real quick. And uh, that makes a nice little setup so I can, I can cook and I can see what I'm doing. And then the way the awning folds out, if you watch my previous video on the hardcore lighting, my awning has one arm that comes right here and it's also got a hardcore light on it. So on the bottom here, I just have some cheap plastic trays. This was gonna be a drawer originally when I was building it and then I decided I didn't wanna do that. So uh, just, just cause I was gonna lose more space. And so I ended up just turning it into a little bit of a pocket and inside here, this is a Blue Ridge recovery bag and I've got that stuffed in there as well as as well as my tool roll. So I keep that in there. I'm glad I didn't put a drawer in the back of this because I was able to fit the lithium battery and the Red Arc BCDC 1225 in there later on. And uh, it's nice just having it all tucked away. I don't have to worry about it. It's one of the, it's one of the nice things about the Red Arc stuff is it just works. So you can kind of tuck it away. And some people want to be able to see the lights to make sure there's not a malfunction or something like that but I can keep an eye on my batteries and make sure everything's working. So I'm not too concerned with it. If I ever do need to see it, I can pop these bolts out. It takes me just a couple minutes. I pull that plate off and then I can diagnose and see what's going on. But generally speaking, there's nothing moving in there. The wires aren't moving, they're secured down. So I don't have to worry about that. The battery's just tucked in there. The charger's tucked in there. It just does its thing. I don't have to plug anything in. It's really nice. So in these two drawers, they fit perfectly. I got these cheap, they're like Walmart plastics. Now my fridge is riding on the DFG off-road fridge slider. It works really good, slides out as good as it always has. And then I have the cutting board that slides out from underneath that. And then I've got the Blue Ridge Overland gear cook bag on there. I pretty much everybody's seen these things at this point. This is one of the cooler products. It's easily removable. And if your buddy doesn't bring something or they're cooking over at their camp, you can grab all your stuff and go over and help them if you need to, something like that. So that bag's really nice. I do recommend those. And then of course I've got the Snowmaster 56D dual zone uh, refrigerator. I did a review on this a number of years ago. I'm actually gonna do a follow-up review before too long. This fridge has been absolutely awesome. I really like the Snowmaster stuff. Now that I've used another brand with the camper, I definitely prefer Snowmaster. It just, I, I just like it better. My cover here is looking a little brown, but um, anyway, that, that refrigerator works awesome. The fridge slider works awesome. And then I put like a uh, cable roller on there. So the whole thing just zips up real easy. This whole thing I built myself and 
it kind of shows that it's kind of rugged looking. Um, so this is a, just a simple drawer. I put my hydro flask cups and stuff in here. So depending on the trip, I organize that a little bit different. And then this is my partner steel stove. I just keep that on there with the smallest rock straps. These are the little thin versions. Uh, it holds fine. It doesn't rattle. It doesn't move. It doesn't go anywhere. So that's where my partner steel stove sits. I'm considering taking the stove out of the camper and building a platform to install that on or install another partner steel stove on. The partner steel stove is so nice to cook on. It doesn't blow out. It's got tons of heat. I very much prefer that to the camper stove. So anyway, with the rock straps up here, I can pull this down real easy. So I can set it up real quick and easy. And then when I'm done, instead of actually unbuckling these, I just slide it forward like that. And then at the front, my cargo net will actually block that from being able to go forward. So in the case of like an accident or something like that, the cargo net will prevent that from moving any further. But as far as trails, this is secure. I have the front runner boxes. I do really like these compared to some of the other options. They fit my little shelf here really nicely. And one of them I carry food in. The other one I carry my pots and pans in. I'm running a cub pack right now and I used to have two wolf packs and I wanna get another one. The, the cub pack's a little small, but I actually sacrificed my second wolf pack to a diesel heater build that I did over the winter. And so I put a Planar um, diesel heater in the other one, cut it up and stuff. And now you can't get the wolf packs because everything's on back order because of COVID. But as soon as they're available, I'm gonna get another wolf pack because it's my preferred method. So I do use rock straps back here as well. Um, those are awesome because if you expand, like I have a collapsible toilet on the back here, and whenever I'm packing that up, I can just cinch this down and it'll work with different sizes of loads. Or sometimes if I have a ton of food, some of it comes out here and I can stack more stuff on and adjust that and it works really well. My hydro flask I have anchored to the side wall in here and I've got it strapped down, basically strapped to the side of the truck. So whenever I'm at the back of the vehicle, I usually hang that right there and give this a few pumps. And then anytime I need water, I can just use water out of the back. I rarely have to take that can out. So if I do, I just remove the two packs and then I can get to the water real easy and fill that thing back up. No big deal. I have a little bit of space on the side of my fridge pack here between that and the glass, and I can perfectly fit a camping table, two Kelty camping chairs and the legs for the scottle. And so that keeps it out of the dog's way in the back and we'll rotate around that so you can see that. But that works really well for that purpose. So those, it's like a perfect fit for everything. As far as the interior goes on this, I've done quite a bit. Starting at the front and kind of working my way around, um, I have the Red Arc dual battery monitor. And then I bought, I forget the brand, but I bought a, uh, a mount for that gauge that sits right here with the rest of the cluster. I have an ultra gauge here so I can tell all my temperatures. I can tell uh, my fuel economy, stuff like that, just because these older vehicles didn't come with that kind of stuff. I've got the Blue Ridge Overland gear visors just because I've got tire gauges and uh, flat little flashlights, stuff like that. I can't even remember some of the brands of some of the stuff. I bought so much stuff over the years. I've got the ASU FTM uh, 400 ham radio. I went and got my ham license. They're so much better than CB if you can get your friends to get on board to actually use one. Um, and then I've got the unit in Bearcat up here. And this is inside of the ARB overhead console, the uh, Outback console, I believe is what they call it. And I mounted my radios and stuff to that. It's got a little bit of drop down space, which is nice. The, the interior lighting is significantly better. As you can see, I'm sitting in the shield seats. Um, you can see a full review on these. These are awesome seats. Every time I do a long road trip, I really appreciate having these. I updated it to a USB port on the dash that feeds into the back of my radio. I've got one of the Pioneer units, so I have um, turn by turn directions with my phone. It's got CarPlay and everything, and that works with Gaia Maps. So instead of mounting an iPad to the front of my dash or something like that, I just have the screen on my stereo, and for me, that works fine. And then on one of my ports, I put the Tow Pro Elite for traveling with the camper. The Tow Pro Elite, I can't say enough good things about that. I can gush over Red Arc all day, but everything they build is really impressive stuff. So that's where the Tow Pro Elite is, so I can get to that real easy. And then I have some more switches here from my air compressor and then my water pump under the hood. On the top of the FJ, whenever I take a shower using this, I do it right here, I roll the window down and I can reach in here and hit my shower pump on and off. So I'm cycling it and warming the water up. And then I have a few USB, um, I have a few USB charging spots right here. So if we're driving, I can plug multiple phones in or I can plug in a camera or something like that. So 
that's the front of the FJ. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. These seats are awesome, especially for a setup like the FJ, because I can pop this forward and I can get to everything that much easier. The factory seats kind of came up, but not as good. I use rock straps back here to hold down all of my camera gear. I carry that in a big Pelican air case. I've got the full goose gear seat delete set up in here. And so what that does is it gives you a little bit of storage under there and I keep tripods and stuff in there usually. And then on that side, on the, on the passenger side, that's blue spot. So usually there's a dog bed sitting right there. I've got the Wrangler net on the ceiling and I put jackets and stuff up here. It makes it easy to get rid of all that stuff and get it off the floor and out of the way. It makes the cab much less cluttered, especially when your spouse is bringing three jackets for every trip. We all know the struggle. I can put my stuff up there. She can put her stuff up there. It makes it really easy. Get stuff out of the way. Doesn't fall on the dog and stuff like that. I also have just a small net that I use that I put on top of all my camera stuff. If I have the scottle or something, it helps secure all that stuff a little bit more. In the back here, I have another fuse panel. The way I set this up with the lithium battery is uh, all my wiring runs to the back here. So my battery's on the back, so all of the accessories are on the back. So it kind of works off of that system. So I put another fuse box back there. So whenever I update and I add more accessories, I'm running it from that fuse box rather than running it from the very front. So it saves me a lot of time doing that. On the back of my seats, I have the Blue Ridge Overland Molly panels, and those hold all sorts of stuff. And I've got my air down stuff and my air compressor line. Now, this is a Peak Design camera bag that I kind of sling here. And then if I'm solo on a trip, I turn that around and I put it on the passenger side to where I can keep my camera on the passenger seat. It makes it a little easier for me. So right here, like I said, these are where my seats and my table sits. And then these three bags we use for various things. We put stuff for the dog in here. We put whatever we need to in these three pockets. I was just trying to use space that wasn't utilized before. On the goose gear stuff, it's nice being able to stuff things in here. I got a cam uh, I keep a hammer in here. Little things like the dog's blanket I keep in here. You can keep some smaller items in that. And then the front boxes are a little bit bigger because they utilize the, uh, the old floor space from when the seats were in here. With most of the goose gear stuff, they make side panels so that these ones that lock, it's actually functional for locking. There's no point to locking them at this point. I do hope they come up with those, but uh, the other vehicles have it. So depending on what your vehicle is, if you buy a goose gear system, you probably have the side panels and then locking it actually makes sense. For me, it doesn't make sense, so I leave them unlocked. But anyway, they're still really nice. It's got tons of bolt holes so you can bolt anything down that you want to and it's a really solid structure, they're bed lined. And so it gives you a nice sturdy place to put things. Mine already scratched up. I haven't really even had them all that long. Under the hood of this thing is pretty cluttered. I've got quite a bit of stuff. My, my old dual battery used to be in the back corner. And uh, as you can see, my engine bay is really dirty and I don't really clean it that often because it just gets dirty the next weekend. So in the back corner, I used to have a dual battery uh, AGM setup, and that's gone now. I originally made my own electronics tray over here, but I ended up going with the power tray just because it's a much nicer setup. And so I've got all sorts of electronics over here. I've got the uh, Blue Sea system switch here, so I can turn my trailer charging on or I can turn my winch on. And I like having a disconnect on my winch just because then uh, I don't have to worry about the power running away on me or the winch running away on me. I can always disconnect it. And then I've got my do-it-yourself sort of s-pod thing here which going back i will buy an s-pod or a switch pro or something for my next vehicle just to make it simple concept of having simplicity on these things is it makes it so much easier and so much nicer to install i've spent so much time wiring this thing uh, so having a switch pro or something like that just plug and play there's a huge benefit to that awning lights the tent lights the rear aside from the refrigerator the refrigerator is always on but all of the lights that are for camping, I turn it on with one switch so I don't have to leave my key in the ignition. So I do have that all set up and that's all off this big relay here. And then all my power goes from there. My starting battery is an Optima red top. Now that my dual battery winching setup's gone, I will switch this over to a yellow top at some point. This is a custom bracket that I made for my ARB single compressor. And the reason I did that was again, saving space. You can buy a bracket so it'll mount back there, but it's right here and it's close and it's already done. So it's not gonna get moved. I put some lights under the hood, that way if I'm on the side of the trail and I need to work on something, that I can check things out, not necessarily have to fumble around and find a flashlight. And it's just kind of nice to have the option. And I've even used it uh, when I'm working on stuff at the house, just 
gives you a little bit of light. Those are really cheap. They're like $7 or something on Amazon. Really cheap, but they've lasted longer than I would have expected. Here I have a heat exchanger. This is a heat exchanger that runs into the coolant system. The other side runs through my FlowJet water pump. The reason for that is I'm using the heat of the engine to heat up water when I take a shower out in the middle of nowhere. And the way this system works is basically I'll hook a garden hose up here, another hose plugs in here, it goes into a bucket, like I'll scoop it out of the creek or something. And then you cycle that water and it'll keep running through this and the engine has to be running, but it'll cycle through this and it'll heat it up over time. And then within about 10 minutes, usually if the engine's hot, you have piping hot water, even possibly too hot for comfort. And so it'll get it all going. And, uh, and then you have a nice hot shower out in the middle of nowhere. I power wash my pans and stuff with this too. I just make sure and put it back on the burner to kind of cook the pan. That way I'm not introducing Giardia or anything like that to my cooking setup. But uh, having a water pump on board is really nice and it kind of simplifies the process of cleaning a lot of the time. The engine's just totally factory, nothing special is going on. I'm at almost 200,000 miles and I've had almost no problems with this other than minor maintenance stuff like idler pulleys and things like that. My most popular videos on the Audi Cab, if you haven't seen that, check that out. It's durable, it's comfortable. Um, the way it's a wedge shape, it, it deflects wind as long as you're parking into the wind. You won't have to deal with the wind like your buddies in the, the soft-sided tents do. And then I have the quick pitch en suite for the shower tent on the driver's side. And on this side, I have the Audi Cab awning. I have a fourth D solar 165 watt panel on top of the tent. That feeds into the Red Arc BCDC and that charger has a green power priority, so it always takes solar before it'll take from the vehicle. So at any given time when this is sitting outside all day long, when I'm not even using the truck, it's charging the battery and it stays at 100% because of the lithium. And then whenever, uh, say I go park in some trees and I'm camped out, it doesn't really matter because as soon as I get on the trail the next day, even if there's no sunshine, the Red Arc will start charging that battery right away. As soon as you start the truck up, it's delivering 25 amps to it and uh, it works extremely well. How fast that, that setup charges that battery is just incredible. You can leave camp with 10% battery and within a couple hours of being on the road, you're at 100% again. You don't even have to think about it. It just does what it needs to do. I've, I personally think for a small SUV, this is an ideal setup as far as the electronics go. I've had multiple different tents on this thing, multiple different roof racks on this thing. I've, I've gone through a lot of iterations of what this vehicle is. This FJ has not been babied. It's done really well. It's performed really well and I still enjoy driving it, though I would like to get a newer vehicle. Okay, so that's my FJ Cruiser. If you have any questions, drop them below. Please like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time.